On February 19, 1979, 11-year-old Norman Alstead Jr., 43-year-old Norman Sr., and his 30-year-old girlfriend Sandra took her from the Santa Monica airport headed for the mountains of Big Bear. Norman Jr. had just won a skiing championship the day before, and in the afternoon headed to Santa Monica for a hockey game. To save time, Norman Sr. chartered a plane back to Big Bear so his son could play hockey, collect his skiing trophy, and then continue to train with the ski team. The Cessna 172 headed east over Venice Beach with Norman Jr. sitting in the front watching the pilot Rob fly over the mountains. From the window seat, he looked at the peaks of the San Bernardino Mountains poking through the grey clouds surrounding them. It is while he was looking at these mountains, he would hear Rob receive a warning from another pilot about the weather conditions on their routes. Rob confirmed he had heard the warning with the control tower, but continued forward. Soon, they glided through the clouds, the grey mist swallowing the plane as it began to shake. Norman, now anxious, looked back at his father, who had just finished eating an apple. His father smiled proudly at his son, calming his nerves. But that feeling wouldn't last long. Through the fog in the window behind his father, the silhouette of a tree limb flashed before him, and pine needles scratched across the window. Seconds later, a branch would explode through the window, and Norman watched his father's face become blotched and deformed. Fog enveloped them. All sense of direction was lost. Rob clenched the plane's steering wheel as it rocked side to side. All Norman could do was watch and scream as another branch appeared and their plane slammed into it. The impact ripped off the wing, turning the plane backwards as it continued to hit tree after tree. The sound of metal ripping filled the plane as it broke apart from the impact and crashed into Ontario Peak. Pieces of its metal frame were torn off and thrown into the air, and with it, the bodies of its occupants. When Norman Jr. awoke, it was to the sound of wind rustling through the pine needles. His body was twisted over a section of the plane's dashboard. Fog and snow swirled around him as he struggled to get his bearings. The howling wind changed directions, thinning out the fog and revealing one of the plane's wings, which was now embedded into the trunk of a tree. His stunned senses came back to him, and he gasped for air, but no matter how deep his breath was, there just wasn't enough oxygen to satisfy his burning lungs. Doing what any 11-year-old would do, Norman called for his father, screaming that he couldn't breathe, but with his body twisted over the dash and on its side, he couldn't turn to see if his father was still behind him. What he could see was the shattered cockpit in front of him. Rob was sprawled out, a bloodied hole, in place of where his nose should have been. Norman continued to struggle for breath before his eyelids forced themselves shut, and he was taken by the darkness. Norman was awoken by the shaking of his body. The cold was so intense it had frozen his hair to the piece of metal his head lay on. The ice cracked like tin foil as he moved it free to scan the crash site for his father. The wreckage was on a 45 degree angle and 15 feet away, Norman could now see Rob's body more clearly. His legs were twisted and his shirt had been pulled up, revealing his pale white stomach. Norman wriggled out of his seat, and as he did, the piece of the dashboard shifted, falling through the ice and tumbling down the mountain. Norman also began to slide down its face before rolling onto his stomach and gripping the snow to stop his fall. Inch by inch, he crawled toward Rob's corpse, and soon, the ice became harder and easier to hold. When he got close enough, he confirmed what he had seen before he blacked out. Rob's nose had been ripped from his face and lay only a short distance away from him. Though his eyes were open and looking at Norman, brain matter was visible from the back of his skull, suggesting he had died on impact. Rob's injuries were horrific, especially for an 11-year-old child to witness. And a new wave of fear washed over Norman, who began to call for his father. His voice echoed across the mountain, and soon he heard Sandra's voice calling back to him. Norman followed her voice through the fog as white snow lashed around him, and found Sandra still buckled to her seat after it had been torn from the plane. Trembling from the cold, and with tears in her eyes, she told Norman his father was dead. Not willing to believe Sandra, Norman searched through the sea of white, and before long, he saw a figure. The thick fog had hidden it on his way to Sandra, but now he could make out the silhouette of his father. Norman Sr.'s head was between his knees, 
his arms hung limply by his thighs. Sandra called out in horror, and Norman tried to reassure her and himself that he was just unconscious. There was no way his father, the man he looked up to as indestructible, had passed. Sandra's crying worsened. She brought her left hand to her face, unable to lift her right arm where the shoulder was dislocated and now hanging below her collarbone. Norman edged up the snowshoe toward his father's elevated position. Soon, he was close enough to see the color of his dad's brown hair through the fog. But despite his calls, Norman Sr. remained still. As quickly as Norman's tears flowed, they appeared to freeze to his cheeks and he desperately tried to get closer to his father's body. In his attempt, Norman slipped back down the slope and further away from him. Unable to reach his father by climbing from the snowshoot in front of him, he turned around and hiked past Rob's body, which was now partly buried in snow. When Norman finally reached his father, he put his lips to his ears and begged him to wake up. But there was no movement. Though he didn't want to accept it, Sandra was right. His father had passed. Norman returned to Sandra, unbuckled her seatbelt, and helped her across the sloping snow toward a wing of the plane. It would be while the two were resting under it that Norman would hear something which brought hope. The sound of a helicopter patrolling above. Running out from under the wing, Norman chased the sound only to hear it fall away into the distance. A short time later, it would return, hovering above the treetops, but again, it would fail to spot him. From their height, Norman would see the roof of a cabin far in the distance below the mountain. It offered hope, but getting to it would mean Sandra and Norman would need to spend hours climbing down the mountain slopes to reach it. When Norman mentioned the cabin to Sandra, she told him they needed to wait for rescue, and for a time, he did wait. But Norman couldn't sit still and wait to die. Insisting he was going to leave with or without Sandra, she finally agreed to try climbing down the mountain despite her dislocated shoulder. Using a stick as an ice pick, Norman would edge his way down, and Sandra would slide toward him until her feet rested on his head and shoulders. It took longer than expected to move just 30 feet down the mountain, and in an attempt to move faster, Sandra would slip and tumble down to Wood Norman. Luckily, Norman was able to stop Sandra before she fell off the slope completely, but they were forced back into moving slowly on their stomachs down the slope. But their attempts to slow down weren't enough. Eventually, Sandra would slip again, this time sliding down a snow funnel and disappearing from Norman's sight. He would climb down to find Sandra, following a trail of blood she had left behind on her descent. Eventually, Norman would move closer to the wooded trees bordering the mountain, and the idea of reaching it became more achievable. Here, Norman decided to slide down the slope using two sticks he had taken from a nearby tree as his brakes. Sliding downward, Norman came to a small cliff face, and here, he found Sandra. Her eyes were wide open, and her skin purple. Norman tried calling to her, but Sandra's body remained lifeless. Norman climbed down and begged Sandra to move, but her body remained still. Not sure what to do next, Norman covered Sandra's body with twigs, burying everything but her face under them. With no other option, Norman would continue sliding down the mountain, using his sticks to break and steer, until finally, he came to the woods at the bottom. Moving toward the direction of the roof he'd seen, Norman would pass a creek, and as night began to fall, he would finally come across shoe tracks. Soon, a voice would call to him. It was the voice of a teenager who heard his movements. When the two came face to face, the boy, aware like the rest of the town of the crash, knew exactly where Norman had come from. The boy would take him back to his home, the cabin Norman had seen from the mountain. And after a grueling climb from over 8,000 feet in a blizzard, Norman found safety. Sadly, he would be the only one in his group to survive.